Today, what we're going to do is shift our focus outwards a little bit. Um, so to do that, we're going to start off with a panel that I've been really excited about to talk about conservation stewardship and to look a little bit at a different industry and, and think about practices there. So to do that, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Vanessa Puig-Williams of Puig-Williams Law. Let's welcome them this morning. Thank, thank you, Sarah. I am so excited to kick off the final day of what has been such an enjoyable um, and educational last two and a half days for me, and I hope for everybody else. So Sarah and Beth, thank you guys. For, you all have done a great job. So um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about this panel because it's merging two areas of law that I have been fortunate enough to practice in Austin, and that is uh, water law, groundwater law, and um, conservation law. And so, uh, let me not forget that I have this. I thought that this was a really perfect quote, you know, in part because we are here in Alamo City in San Antonio to have a, a quote from Davy Crockett, but I think it really speaks to all of the issues that we've been discussing and wrestling with um, here at this conference, and that's you know, how do we manage a shared resource that's privately owned that is of value to everybody, both landowners and the public? And so that's something that we're, you know, wrestling with here in the groundwater world, and it's, it's something that I feel like the land conservation community has, has some answers to and some, you know, ways to approach that, how we conserve something that is valuable. So we have four really um, bright and talented panelists here, and I'm glad they're here to engage in this discussion. We have Lori Olson with the, she's the executive director of the Texas Land Trust Conservancy, or sorry, Texas Land Trust Council. And then we have Roel Lopez, who's the director of Texas A&M National Resources Institute. Grant Ellis, who is the natural resources manager for the city of San Antonio. And Blair Fitzsimmons, who is um, CEO of the Texas Agricultural Land Trust and a landowner yourself. So why don't we get started? Um, Lori, you, you run a association of land trusts, and so you know, I think it might be helpful to begin this conversation to give the audience some background about what a land trust is, what a conservation easement is, how those transactions work. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you guys for having us today. We're excited to be here and share some, I think, what will be a great, some information, but hopefully open up some opportunities for collaboration between um, groundwater management districts and land conservation groups around the state. So yeah, I run the Texas Land Trust Council, which is the statewide association, um, sort of like tagged, but it's for all of the land trusts or land and water conservation organizations that work in Texas. So um, you can see up on the uh, screen there, you know, those are our members. They range from, you know, the Nature Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, which are obviously big national groups, um, down to much smaller groups like um, the Pines and Prairies Land Trust in Bastrop or the Hill Country Conservancy in Austin. So we run the gamut. Um, we have about 31 members all doing land and water conservation work. So um, what is a land trust? Um, essentially, a land trust is a nonprofit, private um, organization whose mission, whose, you know, who's basically what they do is land and water conservation, and they do that in a variety of different ways via um, land uh, purchase or using conservation easements, um, environmental education, all kinds of different outreach projects um, and community conservation projects. So a lot of different ways. Um, land trusts, you know, because, you know, one of the main tools we use here in Texas um, is the conservation easement. So um, land trusts in Texas have, have helped to conserve um, like 1.65 million acres of land, um, about 967, I think, thousand acres of that um, is in conservation easements. So conservation easements are essentially um, privately negotiated, they're legal agreements, um, they're negotiated between a landowner and a land trust. Um, or the, in some cases, they could be negotiated with a government entity, but usually with a land trust. 
and they set aside, they basically establish which con conservation values um, that are to be protected on that, that particular property um, that the landowner wants to see protected. And the land trust is essentially the partner that they work with um, that's going to, um, in the end, once the easement is recorded, that the, the land trust holds that easement and they are the ones that uh, monitor and enforce it um, over time. And they're gonna continue to work with, that land trust entity is gonna continue to work with subsequent owners of that property um, because the easement is legally binding and does um, run with the title to the land. So um, it is a perpetual tool, and um, but the, the key to it, and I think this is really important here in Texas, is that um, it the, the land remains in private ownership. So the landowner retains um, full control and ownership and management of their land and they've essentially, the easement essentially um, sets aside um, the development rights um, to some extent, and that is, again, determined by the landowner. Um, and what the landowner is seeking to protect in terms of conservation values is also sort of determined by the landowner. And the goal is to find a land trust whose conservation mission sort of jives um, with that landowner's goals for their land. Um, and then they, those two entities work together to um, conserve um, those resources in perpetuity. So it's really a, a tool for landowner who has that, that stewardship conservation ethic to be able to accomplish that. Exactly. I mean, there are, there are some financial incentives for sure to do conservation easements, but I mean, the, by and large, the, the, the issue that is at the forefront of most of these landowners' mind is, is the conservation ethic and preserving their land. Um, for future generations um, and for, for Texas and to preserve our, our wildlife habitat and our water resources and all those great things that we have here and agricultural resources so that we can um, be sure to enjoy those um, for decades to come. Well, Blair, maybe you can um, speak to a little bit more about that. Um, your land trust is focused on agricultural land specifically. Can you, and, I, and as a, a landowner yourself, um, can you maybe describe like what is, um, what are the reasons that a landowner might actually want to move forward with this and then what is incentivizing them to do so? Sure. First of all, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning and have the opportunity to talk about this topic, that, which may be a bit foreign to many of you here in the room. So we're delighted to be here. Um, a little bit of context for the question, if that's okay. Uh, I run the Texas Agricultural Land Trust, which is uh, one of the largest state-based land trusts in Texas. We have about 226,000 acres under conservation easement throughout the state, ranging from 70 acres to 71,000 acres, so uh, quite the gamut. Uh, we were created by three statewide agriculture, hunting, and farming organizations, Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers, Texas Farm Bureau, Texas Wildlife Association, that felt, who felt those organizations, the leadership of those organizations felt like landowners needed another tool in the toolbox. Often when um, those values go up, uh, mom or dad dies, the state tax bill comes, landowners have few options other than just to hang on and try to pay that tax bill or to sell to be able to pay it. And so a conservation easement is a tool that can be used to help in the state planning process. Uh, as, as Lori mentioned, uh, and additionally, it can provide in, in financial incentives uh, to meet the family's conservation goals. So um, I wear another hat, and that is as a landowner. As Vanessa mentioned, uh, I saw my brother-in-law, Ryland Howard, come in. Ryland, raise your hand. Um, Ryland's wife and my husband are sister and brother, and a number of years ago decided to do a conservation easement on, on our family ranch, um, which is, was their grandfather's. And you asked about motivation and why landowners do it, and it, it, it's really a mix of, of reasons. Certainly we've got some springs on the ranch that they were very interested in protecting um, through a conservation easement. But it was bigger than that. It was. It was. It really comes from a love of the land, um, and the fact that we have spent all of our adult lives, and they spent many of their younger lives, trying to improve that land, 
and to leave it in better shape than, than they found it. And a conservation easement is simply a way to help protect and memorialize that conservation ethic um, while protecting the springs, while protecting the wildlife habitat, uh, while keeping it in open space and protecting the agricultural productivity. It's a voluntary tool, and I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind, is that no one forces a landowner to do a conservation easement. They are willingly giving up these development rights, which in some cases are very valuable um, and a, a strong part of their property right in order to protect that land in perpetuity. And it is a financial incentive, and, and there are a lot of landowners out there that just want to, they're driven by a conservation ethic, and frankly, we need more, con we need more financial incentives like the conservation easement to help these landers, uh, landowners achieve those conservation goals. And so can you talk just for a minute about, um, you mentioned that your property has springs on it, and that was one of the reasons that um, motivated you to you know, seek out a conservation easement. And so I think that might you know, pique everyone's interest here, is how can um, putting a conservation easement on your land, conserving your land, work to protect springs? It, it really goes back to the document and how it's written. So. Uh, I can speak from the perspective of the Texas Agricultural Land Trust where our conservation easements require that the land stay with the property. And so um, the, the water may not be leased or sold. Uh, it has to, to stay there on property. Should a landowner want to retain the right to lease some of those water rights, they would have to go get a hydrology study to demonstrate to us that the leasing of those water rights will not impair the conservation values of that property. So is it a perfect solution? No. Um, and for all the reasons that, that you all are very aware, you know, what goes on across the fence line can impact that, that property as well. And that is an issue that, frankly, as, as the conservation community, um, we need to address. Yeah, and we'll, we can maybe talk a little bit deep into that a little bit more. Um, okay, well, let's, let's kind of get to Grant for a second because we, we touched on the, you know, how you, through conserving land, you can also protect water, and that's really exactly what the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program was designed to do. So can you give us a little bit of background about that program and, um, you know, why it's so important for the city of San Antonio? Yeah, so I'm Grant Ellis, um, and thank Sarah and Vanessa and everybody else uh, for inviting uh, me here today. I, I'm the Natural Resources Manager for the City of San Antonio's Parks and Recreation Department, um, and I oversee uh, the city's Aquifer Protection Program as well. Uh, I, for five years, I actually managed that program for the city, and prior to that, I worked on the land trust side of, <coughs> of the equation and, um, and, and worked uh, for Green Spaces Alliance for a while, uh, exclusively working on this program. And so I, I've been working on the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program in some capacity for, for about eight, or eight, eight to 10 years now. And the program itself is a, <clears throat> um, it's a voter supported initiative. Uh, it's a one eighth cent sales tax that is collected by the city of San Antonio. So one eighth of every penny that you spend in San Antonio uh, goes towards aquifer protection. Uh, that the city collects and then uses to purchase uh, conservation easements or land over the sensitive parts of the aquifer that impact the city of San Antonio. So you can see the map um, up on the screen here and all of the yellow polygons, all the yellow parcels that you see um, on that map are conservation easements that the city has purchased from landowners uh, over the recharge and contributing zones of the of the aquifer. Um, and can you can you describe what that means when you say you've purchased a conservation easement? Right. So there are two ways, uh, or primarily two ways, that that conservation easements um, are created. Uh, landowners can donate a conservation easement to a qualified holder of easements, uh, such as a land trust or a governmental agency, um, or they can um, sell a conservation easement. Most land trusts throughout the state of Texas don't have the financial means with which to purchase conservation easements. Um, but the city of San Antonio, through this program, 
has a dedicated funding source right now to purchase these conservation easements. And what it means is that we are essentially uh, buying uh, development rights uh, from the property owners. We are purchasing uh, a certain amount of rights for the exclusive purpose of protecting recharge, the quality and quantity of, reach of water recharging into the aquifer. Um, and so these are, as Blair pointed out, voluntary agreements between the city of San Antonio and these landowners. Um, to date, we have protected over um, 152,000 acres of land, um, 145,000 plus uh, of which is held in conservation easements, which the city of San Antonio monitors with our partners at the Edwards Aquifer Authority. We have an interlocal agreement with uh, the EAA to go out and monitor all of these conservation easements that we have purchased on an annual basis. Um, I think it's important to point out that if you're looking at the map, obviously San Antonio is in Bayer County, which is the, the big polygon off to the, to the far right of the, of the map. Um, but the vast majority of the conservation easements and the yellow parcels that you see are out to the left, to the west of San Antonio. The, the reason for this is that the groundwater flow path of water um, that feeds into the, the, the aquifer pool that the San city of San Antonio draws from is from west to east. And so water that recharges in Medina and Uvalde counties, which are the two counties to the west of Bayer County, um, actually ends up in the San Antonio pool from which the city of San Antonio draws their water. So it's, it's extremely important for us to um, work with these landowners who are over the sensitive parts of the aquifer uh, in the western counties to protect that land because it, it directly impacts the city of San Antonio and our drinking water. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the other way that he's mentioned easements being donated, so I just wanted to be sure you all understood that there is a, a federal um, income tax deduction specifically for donations of conservation easements so that when funding like um, like Grant and San, the city of San Antonio enjoys um, doesn't exist. There are other, that's another one of the financial incentives. So um, if a landowner is motivated to donate a conservation easement to a qualified entity, then they would get a significant tax reduction, income tax reduction that they can carry forward for um, up to 15 years um, for the value of those development rights that they're giving up. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And so with this um, program in San Antonio, it's, it's all, the land is still retained, private ownership, and through the sales tax, you all are able to basically pay these landowners who are agreeing to um, not develop their property and not do certain things with their water that would otherwise um, affect its quality and quantity. Is that the big picture? That is, that is okay. the big picture. And, and it, you know, I mean, it, it's important, to, I think, to note also that, that, you know, several decades ago, the citizens of San Antonio and the, the policymakers in San Antonio, the, the elected officials and, and the stakeholders, the water conservation groups, um, realized that um, the Edwards Aquifer was so important to the city of San Antonio. For many, many years, obviously, the Edwards was the, um, the sole uh, source of, of drinking water for the city and citizens of San Antonio. Um, today, I believe it, 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 it's, it's about 85% of the drinking water, so it's still a very important uh, source of water for the city of San Antonio. Um, knowing that, uh, it makes sense to protect it in, in long term. And so um, when in 2000 this uh, ballot measure, this, this initiative was first passed by the voters of San Antonio, um, it ushered in a new wave of, of water conservation for the city of San Antonio that, um, that, that it hasn't been realized in many places across the state uh, for the basic reason that San Antonio is just you know, geographically unique and we have uh, such a heavy reliance on the Edwards. Yeah, it's, you know, it seems like the city of San Antonio and all of its residents really recognize the value of um, that water and that aquifer. And, and Roel, that is something that you um, have completely Completed, you've done a, one study a couple years ago, and now you've just completed, I think, a, a more recent one. Um, and that's really analyzing the economic value that conserving land um, plays in terms of protecting water and, and actually maybe even developing water supplies. So can you um, share with us a little bit about that? Sure. 
Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll start by saying these chairs are extremely comfortable. <laughs> Don't so, fall asleep. <laughs> so, but um, again, it's a, like the other panelists, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so a little bit of background and, and uh, the, some of the comments mentioned thus far have set the stage for, for what I'll briefly talk about. Uh, land stewardship, we've heard that term and what that means from a, a water per, uh, protection or conservation perspective or groundwater uh, perspective. And, and just to start there a little bit, you know, LBJ uh, uh, talked about water conservation starts where the first raindrop falls. It's a real well-known quote, water conservation starts where the first raindrop falls. And so land, private land, a farm, a ranch, in essence is a soul into groundwater supplies. And so when an acre of land is, is properly managed or steward, it serves to act as a sponge, capture that water, and put water into the ground. Water in the ground also serves to maintain those springs and rivers and so forth. They're, the two are connected, and, and again, I'm speaking to, to folks that uh, obviously know that. Uh, a few years ago, the state was interested in trying to have funding to support the conservation of farms and ranches from a water perspective, plus other perspectives as well. And so we were uh, asked by the Texas Ag Land Trust, uh, the Trust for Pro Public Land, and TNC, uh, as well as other partners to, to do this initial study in assessing the Texas Farm and Ranch Land Conservation Program. So that's the state program that was established now a couple of years ago. 12. About 12, but it's, ne <laughs> it's never had uh, a, 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 right, uh, a real steady stream for funding. And so the purpose of this study uh, was to try to assess what's the value of conserving those in this case, seven properties. And so the, the legislators uh, put $2 million into the program uh, a few years ago. And what we found in our assessment for those properties was that uh, those properties contributed about um, $11 million in terms of uh, water replacement costs. In other words, uh, what would be the cost of, of if those is approximately about 10,000 acres, if they were to be paved, what's the water loss, uh, that water going into that ground uh, due to uh, you know, development or what have you? And, and that was one of the findings from that study is that the, the value of conservation, conservation easements was about $11 million for that $2 million investment. So a six to one investment. And when you look at the cost of infrastructure, uh, within the state water plan and so forth. Uh, again, it's, it's a, frankly a, a very cost-effective measure. And so I think starting to think about land as a, as a tool for much like what Grant uh, just talked about, as a mechanism for maintaining and, and protecting groundwater and, and ensuring that there's fresh water supplies moving forward. Um, more recently, and this hasn't even come out yet, but uh, we hope to release this here in the next month or so. We, we took that same approach for those initial seven properties in assessing that state program, and we applied it to the nearly one million acres under conservation easement by these various land trusts like Talt and the Hill Country Conservancy and so forth. And so it's about 960,000 or so acres. And from that assessment, the, it, it's basically almost a billion uh, or a million acre feet of water that's protected annually and at a cost of almost uh, $1.6 billion. So, so again, there's value to protecting those lands from a, from a water perspective. And so that's uh, some of the, the findings that we've uh, been working on. And the purpose for that is being able to make the case for land conservation, mm -hmm. to be, being able to support programs like, like the Texas Farm and Ranch Land Conservation Program, as well as some of the work that the uh, uh, various land trusts do in the state. That's just, I mean, that's fascinating that really you can save that much mo money by conserving land. So 
you know, one thing that we've been talking a lot about here at the conference is is the private property, you know, aspect of groundwater and. Um, and you know, I, I'm sure you're aware that you know the the legislature and the Texas Supreme Court has now held that um, groundwater is owned in place by overlying landowners. So, you know, I, I'm wondering, Roel, if you could maybe like speak to you know what you think is significant about this you know this um, law that we have in perspective about value in groundwater and owned in place. Well, again, I'm speaking to the choir here, but I think the value of, of water in the ground is obviously uh, having water available for use in, in, in that substrate. But beyond that, it's also ensuring that there's water on, uh, in our rivers and springs and so forth. Uh, I think oftentimes um, we, well, our, our state sort of looks at those two sources of water as though they're separate, and we all know that they're not, they're connected. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the challenge is, is uh, uh, looking at the, that connection and the fact that they are, in fact, uh, interrelated. And so that's one, one key piece to it. So I think to, to expand on that, you know, as a private landowner, you can monetize your water when you sell it. And what this is, is, and, and, this program, the Texas Farm and Ranchlands Conservation Program and other easement programs are a way to monetize keeping that water in the ground. And that's, that we need more programs like that. This was a, a great first start. Mm -hmm. um, the Texas Water Development Board um, has just come out um, with a position that uh, the state uh, clean water revolving fund may be used, it's a, it's, a complicated, um, a, it's a complicated approach, but in short, to fund the purchase of conservation easements. That's another tool in the toolbox, if you will. The Aquifer Protection Initiative that, that Grant runs is yet another tool in the toolbox. So those are programs that we need to help incentivize keeping water in the ground. Yeah, Lori, can you talk about that Water Development Board decision? Well, I want to say one other one thing first. Yeah, so I mean, I think the city of San Antonio program and their situation is really unique because they've had a lot of science, a lot of hydrologists study the area. They, they understand their aquifer really well and how it works. It flows from west to east. It, you know, acts in a certain way and they know where they need to conserve that. They figured out where they needed to conserve land in order to preserve that resource. And I think, you know, obviously different aquifers across the state, um, are all very different, you know, and they, they work differently. And, and so I think we need, we need better science to understand those connections and where, you know, in, in all of your different groundwater districts, you know, where are those priority areas where you need to conserve the surface in order to best recharge um, the water? And so, you know, if we have, you know, because in San Antonio, when they had that science, then you take that science and then you have the land conservation organizations that come to the table and then, you know, you can work together and say, okay, here's where um, the science shows that we need to conserve land, so let's put some resources some money to that, and then um, the land conservation organizations can go out and help to um, bring landowners to the table and, and get those lands hopefully under, under easement, or at least a lot of them under easement, to preserve the resource. So I think that's an area where um, groundwater conservation districts and land conservation organizations can seek to collaborate in the future, um, and hopefully we can get some better science around groundwater um, and surface water and, and, and how these things actually work so that we can do more of what's going on in San Antonio and other communities. It, uh, well, and, I want to talk about that Water Development Board funding because yes. I think it's really interesting, but Grant looks like I, he has I just wanted to, to, add. To, to I just wanted to add to that. I mean, I think the science behind it was critical for the success of the City of San Antonio's program um, and, and, and for the, for just for the implementation of the program, having the science to back up the, the, the work that we wanted to do was critical to get the, the voter support uh, behind it. Now that the program has been around for 18 years, um, the, the, the understanding is that um, you know, this, is, this is all very accepted science. We're moving forward, and we're learning more every, every year. Um, but the, the collaboration that we have with the land trust community and with the 
um, landowners is, and with the Groundwater Conservation District with EAA, is you know is also very important to point out. Uh, you know, we've got a municipal entity working with local land trusts, working with a groundwater conservation district to protect land and water uh, for a, a, you know a city of two million people. So it's it's a pretty unique program. Well, but, it, but it doesn't mean it can't be duplicated. Let's kind of build on that a little bit, though. I mean, Blair, what are <clears throat> some of the obstacles that you see, you know, when you have a conservation easement and a landowner's given up their rights to develop that property, to develop their groundwater resources? You'd mentioned that, you know, you have some concern that that's not always going to be protected because you can't control what happens on the other side of the fence. So what are some of the challenges you see in protecting groundwater through easements? And is, you know, what, do you think there's any role or, or discussions that we need to have with the groundwater district community? Well, <clears throat> that is the challenge, uh, especially for smaller properties when you put an easement on it and one of the stipulations of that easement is that that water will not be transferred off property but yet your neighbor um, is, is able to, to sell or, or utilize um, his or her water in a, in a commercial way that could potentially impact that protected property, that's a challenge. I don't know what the answer is mm -hmm. to that, given, given our current law, which, you know, the, the organization, we, are, uh, came, we come out of the landowner community, we were created by the three organizations that worked very hard to to um, confirm that groundwater is a is a private property right. So we we are committed to that uh, principle. Um, I think there there needs to be a, a collective um, coming together of the minds, if you will, to figure out how we are going to further protect those properties that are protected by by conservation easement. And I don't I don't have the answer to that other than yeah. advocating for and helping to create a mass of conservation easements in a certain region, just like San Antonio is doing. So, I mean, San Antonio really is, is the model for that. The other part of the state where that's happened is the Davis Mountains. Um, but a lot of that, again, it goes back to incentives and motivation and, and the resources available. So you know, perhaps through some of your organizations, if there's an opportunity to develop funding sources that then could lead to the development of a, of a broader um, uh, area of protected properties, that would be one way to address that. And so the Water Development Board just approved funding um, that would enable conservation easement transactions that help um, what, if, um, protect water quality through like, yeah, so, non-point source? Yeah, they, they didn't, it wasn't like a new funding source, but it's the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, which gets about $550 million annually, more or less, um, to do uh, water quality and, you know, protection projects around the state. But what they did, they just recently approved a change to that specifically sort of outlines that, that conservation easements over, you know, um, to protect, you know, to prevent non-point source pollution and pr preserve you know, water quality, that kind of thing, is definitely something that, that that funding can be used for, and it has been used for in other states for, for many years. So we're excited that that change has just taken place, so starting, you know, with the next round of funding, that's something that um, is possible. So it's, it's just good to see the state recognizing that sort of land-water connection, I think, you know, with, you know, surface water and groundwater being connected. Um, so it, I think the more we kind of go down these roads where we understand that and we start to manage a lot, manage our resources um, to preserve um, the water, um, we'll be in better shape. So it's a great thing. Okay. Well, did you want to add anything about, you know, the challenges that we face with um, actually protecting water through easements? Yeah, and, and actually kind of uh, build a little bit on what Lori just said. Okay. You know, one of the, the things that we lag behind in the state is there, there are several federal programs that we can capitalize on for conservation easements, whether it's from an agricultural perspective or, or a water perspective or even a military perspective. And so there's, there's a, a large funding sources, 
maybe large isn't the right word. There's funding sources that are federal in nature that we could use, but for many of them, they require a, a state match. And so one of the, the challenges that Texas has had uh, in, in recent years is, is finding sources of funds uh, at the state level. So that's the value of the Texas Farm and Ranch Land uh, Conservation Program, Grants Program, mm -hmm. and, and this change that Lori just talked about, is, is being able to start to get funds that could be used to leverage those dollars because, uh, again, typically the, the leverage ratio is like three to one. So, you know, I could get 75% of federal dollars, match it with 25% of state dollars or private contribution, whether and there may be a donation aspect to that. And, uh, and through that effort, collectively benefit, again, uh, the conservation of those private lands and affording those public benefits. So again, that's, that's sort of the main takeaway, I think, that's important here. And that, I mean, um, county is also what can be a source of funding, because I know I've participated in Travis County's um, Citizen Bond Stakeholder Committee for their open space. So, but it's actually, I learned through that that it's not really utilized that often. Um, so, I mean, do you think that that in the future might be, um, we might see more counties stepping up and as they're, as they're um, the, you know, the citizens in those counties recognize that with growth that's happening and the importance of protecting water quality and quantity, do you think we'll see more of that? I mean, I would like, I would hope so. Um, I mean, the city of Austin has a big water quality lands conservation mm -hmm. program, and then Travis County does as well. I think it's an area where, you know, groundwater conservation districts can partner with their counties and talk about these issues, and land trusts can also be brought in to discuss, um, you know, how we can how we can do this stuff, because it's definitely doable, and I think people just aren't having enough of those kind of synergistic conversations to make it happen in more places. Yeah, so that, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, we... Uh, I guess it was 10 years ago, it was after the Texas Farm and Ranchlands Conservation Program passed, we went back to the legislature to clarify that counties have the authority to use county monies to purchase conservation easements. And we did some promotion at the time to make counties aware of this, but what we found is a lot of the water resources that need to be protected are way out there. Mm -hmm. And those counties typically don't have the revenue base to come up with a fund to, um, to purchase conservation easements. So once you get out of Bear County, Travis County, Harris County, Tarrant County, et cetera, it's very difficult for these counties, many of them, to come up with the money to do that, which is why we need the statewide program like the Texas Farm and Ranchlands Conservation Program. That, that's why that program is so critical because as I said, so many of the water resources, watersheds, et cetera, that need to be protected are far from the city centers. So the, the city of San Antonio has, has been able to work with the NRCS to leverage the Edwards Aquifer Protection Dollars with the FRPP, the Farm and Ranch Land Protection Funds that they've made available uh, in the past. But one of the things that we're looking at right now, and again, this is unique to San Antonio in some sense, but not unique to the state of Texas. Um, there are other areas I think that may, may, may be able to look at this, but um, we are working right now with Joint Base San Antonio and, and Fort Sam Houston to look into the possible use of, of partnering or leveraging funds from the EAPP with um, the Army Compatible Use Buffer Zone Program uh, and called ACUB, um, which is a, another potential source of funds because we have Camp Bullis on the northern end of San Antonio in Bear County, which is, it just happens to lie over the recharging contributing zones of the Edwards Aquifer. And so this is area that we're looking to protect. And so there are landowners that surround Camp Bullis on certain sides um, who you know, may be interested in, in selling a conservation easement to the city as well. So, so to kind of add on that, so ACUB is, is the Army's uh, buffer program. Uh, the, one of the primary funding sources for that program is uh, REPI, the Readiness Environmental Protection Integration Program. And so that's a, a program that, that we've uh, been involved in supporting for about a decade or so. And so th that's a great point because looking at ways of, of uh, layering uh, benefits, uh, in this case, if I could protect a piece of property that has water benefits, 
but it also serves to protect a mission for the military. You know, it's at the end of a runway, and so uh, we don't want a, a wind tower at the end of that runway. So, so that's where those type of programs can sort of work in, in tandem, and, and those are the, the creative strategies that I think would be helpful in, in all of us kind of working. So again, that's, that's the value of, uh, of having that state program. REPI doesn't re require a match, ACUB may, uh, and, and so again, so. So benefits, you know, w yesterday we had a really great presentation. One of the uh, work, work groups was about, um, I'm gonna, gotta get the acronym right, managed um, aquifer recharge. And, you know, I came away from that really interested and excited about these different ways that you can actually provide water supplies through, um, you know, whatever you do on your land. And, um, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, if this is maybe something that we, the, the land trust community and the groundwater district community could, could look at together, like what Lori had mentioned, are there properties where, you know, we really want to seek out that we think could actually would, you know, protecting them would also protect the water supply, but maybe we could generate water supplies as well. So, you know, what, I mean, that's just me, you know, brainstorming, but what are some of the ways in, that you think that um, the land trust and the groundwater districts communities could start to work together? Well, um, you know, I think the f first step is, it goes back to the concept of financial incentives for private land stewardship. And we have a, a task force right now called No Land, No Water. It came out of a larger public awareness initiative that, uh, that we put in place um, a couple years ago that encompassed Roel's study and some other things. But one of the things we're looking at is what beyond the conservation easement do we need to um, as the broader conservation community, do we need to um, promote and protect the funding for? So there are a lot of different ways to conserve, um, to manage private property for the benefit of water resources. And what are those different programs? There's some good programs at the Texas Soil and Water Conservation Board that have been defunded or underfunded. Uh, Y'all may know of other um, management programs. We're trying to, right now, the, the, the task of this task force is to do an inventory of what these different programs are that we can then go out and advocate for funding for, recognizing that conservation of private lands really is broader than just the conservation easement. That's just one tool in the toolbox. So what are those other programs? And so that would be a way for this community to work with the land trust community and really the broader conservation community to identify those really critical programs that we have to, we have to protect funding for because frankly, it's war up there at the Capitol as Senator Rodriguez, who I don't know where he went, knows, can attest to, to protect these funding sources. And every year we have to go back, go back and protect the little $2 million appropriation we get for the Texas Farm and Ranch Lands Conservation Program. So it's a way that we could collaborate and, and work to identify uh, programs and protect the funding for them. Yeah, and another thing that our, the Land Trust Council has is um, a database of all the conserved lands um, of all those 1.65 million acres um, that have been protected by all the land trusts in the state. You know, we keep that information. So I think it's, it's a good data set that where groundwater conservation districts and the land trust community can collaborate and see what's been conserved, you know, in my area and where do we want to maybe prioritize adding on to those lands or, you know, that's just kind of a real practical tool that exists. Um, it's a geographic information system, GIS database. And so it has, you know, real information in terms of what's been conserved on the ground and, and what that looks like and how, um, you know, in those systems of protected areas might be enhanced or expanded um, strategically to better conserve water resources. You guys have any thoughts? I think we're kind of getting close. Okay, and then we can maybe take some questions. So do y'all have any 
Anything you want to add or last thoughts? Well, I, I, I just like to, I mean, I, I think it just starts with a conversation, you know. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, the, just, the, why reason, are we doing this? <laughs> the, the reason the reason that the, that the San Antonio, you know, program uh, exists today is because uh, some concerned citizens and, 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 and you know, elected officials and, and a few um, water experts got together at some point in time, sat down and, and discussed yeah. uh, what their options were. Uh, and... Um, yeah. And, and made it happen. And so, you know, if you if you represent a groundwater conservation district and are not familiar with the land trust in your community, then you know there was a I think a list of all the 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 the, the land trusts that are represented by um, by Lori's organization right there. Uh, it's worth looking into uh, and and reaching out and, and having that conversation. So, well, uh, uh, again, uh, the, I was thinking exactly the same thing, Grant. I, I think. Um, the, um, that conversation between these two partners, the land trust community and groundwater districts, if it isn't already occurring, s certainly has tremendous value because, again, uh, you're kind of after the same thing. So are, are there any questions? <laughs> so I've yeah. got one. Oh, <laughs> Gary Westbrook, General Manager, Post Oak Savannah Groundwater Conservation District. Uh, I don't know if any of you were here yesterday. We kind of rolled out a new idea. We have a conservancy program that we're working on. Vanessa and I have talked about that several times. First, I want to encourage you guys to all, uh, Vanessa, if you would make sure that, that uh, all that information, those links are sent to Sarah and Beth so they can forward out to our group. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Second. You said we need to think outside the box, Vanessa. <laughs> this may be a can of worms, but if you establish a conservancy and there's a lot of water that's in place to be conserved, can a groundwater district, should a groundwater district, consider that water in place as part of its desired future condition process? Well, in terms of Removing it from available water for permitting decisions, is, is that what you mean? Um, well, my short answer would be yes, <laughs> but I, I'd want to sit down and really um, look at the law. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, are you, are you all, yeah, I, don't know, I don't even know how, how familiar some of you are with the z desired future condition not, process. Well, not real, that super, but real we need you guys to come yeah. to the Contrary land to that. I mean, yes. I think that... Let's just say I'm very familiar with the term, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to dare answer that one. Um, I think that's that's for more legal minds than than us. I think that what we share in common in terms of what the land conservation community is doing and what groundwater conservation districts are doing is that we're both seeking to protect these natural resources in perpetuity, and so figuring out what is the, you know, what makes sense in terms of how you really are going to ensure groundwater at you know, the levels that we need um, to continue forever to serve our population. And just like we want to continue to, to um, retain the conservation values that we put under easement and keep those values in place in perpetuity. So it's a big challenge you know, um, on our end and on y'all's. So I think um, you know, hopefully some more great minds come together. And yeah. Well, Gary, I think your question's great. And I think it's something that we should all be looking at. So I'm, I'm happy to, to do that with you and whoever else. <laughs> Kendall. Obviously, a lot of the land that we're talking about is private property. There are conservation easements on private property. So I was wondering if you all can talk about some of the complications with opening some of this land up to the public. And if you all thought there would be you know, more support for funding, um, if that's through bonds or sales tax, again, if more of this land was opened up uh, to the public. Yeah, and can, I'll just, yeah, as a preface to that, um, I'm just thinking, you know, Jacobs Well Natural Area in Hayes County is, is kind of an example of land that was um, conserved to protect a spring, and it originally was in the hands of a private land trust, and now through funding, it's, it's been um, deeded over to Hayes County where the public actually is gaining some benefit and education by getting to, to visit. So I think that's a really good question. But So a lot of, um, first of all, when you do a conservation easement, there's no, no, no requirement for public access in any way. Um, that is not something that, um, that needs to happen. 
But some landowners um, can choose to allow some public access, and sometimes they will do that on a portion of their land, or they might allow for a trail easement through it, um, you know, something very narrow or whatever. Um, so, and a lot of the land trusts that hold these easements, even when there is no technical public access, they will work with the landowners to host special events or, or, or guided hikes or other things where, or hunts or things where they can take um, people out on the lands that are protected through easements to enjoy them as well. So that does happen. So in, with the city of San Antonio's program, I mean, the, the, we do not require that the conservation easements um, are open to the public, and n the vast majority of our, of our landowners would not allow the public onto their property. Um, and, and, and that's how most conservation easements are, like, like, um, like Lori said. However, we have used aquifer protection dollars within the city of San Antonio to purchase land outright, um, and then we, in turn, donate a conservation easement um, or you know, uh, pass the conservation easement on to uh, a, a land trust, either the Nature Conservancy or um, actually in one instance, the Edwards Aquifer Authority holds the conservation easement on city-owned land. And that's because with the purchase of these lands, the purchase of the easement, the, the city ne needs to retain some interest, but we can't hold the, the conservation easement and own the land. We've got to have a non-possessory interest in that. So, we can own the land, but we, if we've purchased this with, with aquifer protection dollars, we can make sure um, that the uh, easement itself is, is held by an outside entity and monitored on an annual basis. So. And I think that it, even though it's private, it, in the cases where it remains privately held um, and the public may not have access, the whole point is that it's still providing a public benefit. Right. Correct. So, exactly. okay. So I'm going to com try to combine two Twitter questions because they're kind of in the same field. And Grant, I'm going to—I think that some of this is, is geared towards you. Um, so the first says: San Antonio voters overwhelmingly approved using sales taxes to fund recharge zone protections through conservation easements. Do you think this funding mechanism might be used across the state? And the second question is. Um, if San Antonio has looked at purchasing developing rights from quarries, uh, when the quarries are mined out, they can be used for water storage and recharge. So I guess both San Antonio related questions. Well, to answer the first question, um, can it can can the model be applied across the state? I think in, th in theory, yes, I, absolutely. I, I think that each municipal district and, and municipal um, uh, region probably needs to look at what their natural resources are and what they are willing to protect and what the voter support behind that protection is. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I think if the city of San Antonio had voted 18 years ago uh, for a Golden Cheek Warbler Habitat Protection Program, it probably wouldn't have passed. But the citizens of San Antonio recognize the value of their drinking water and the importance of their drinking water and overwhelmingly supported the passage of that ordinance. Um, so that, you know, and, and, it, and, has, and the citizens have um, renewed that program every five years um, in, in 2005, again in 2010, and most recently in 2015. So, you know, it, it's a very popular program. I, I think that model can be applied in other areas throughout the state, um, but um, you would have to look to determine what the major source of water is and, and, and ha you know, what the best ways are to protect it. Uh, as far as the recharge capabilities of former quarries, I am not a groundwater geologist or hydrogeologist. I, 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 would, I would leave that question, uh, uh, I would probably pass that, if I got an email with that question in it, I would pass it on to my colleagues at the EAA. So. <laughs> I'm Jensi, <clears throat> I'm Jensi Madden from the Comal Trinity uh, GCD, um, and my first question is a simple one. Um, I think that one of our, the major take home I'm getting is that we need to be advocating for more appropriations for the uh, farm and f farmland. I need to know, the question farm is, what is the exact program. act? Take That's a hard form. acronym. <laughs> Farm and Ranch Lands Conservation Program. Program, okay. Texas and this is administered by the uh, Texas Department of Parks and Wildlife. Okay, great. I think the next panel coming up needs to hear from us that this is an important program wow, to idea. be uh, putting money into. Um, I'm uh, from Comal County, and probably most of you know that 
uh, Hill Country is growing like crazy. We are the second fastest growing county in the United States, and we are watching our land being fragmented and uh, being developed in ways that are not in, possibly not sustainable for water. So our county is probably a good candidate for trying to work with, trying to get some grant money to help with um, looking at conservation easements. We do have a group in our county that's trying to figure out how to do that. So any um, recommendations you can give about, um, you know, a good place to go to look for uh, ways to convince county officials. Yeah, I mean, I think the Hill Country Alliance has been working with your county in particular to try and push towards uh, some kind of uh, countywide bond for open space and water um, resource issues. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I think the groundwater conservation districts and all your supporters should go have a powwow with your county commissioners and and <laughs> and and. Uh, and talk about this and see if you can get the support to make it happen because I think you have the tax base to do it. So, I think are we we're about I think we're out of time. Can we maybe we can meet um, outside if anybody else has other questions? You want, oh, you've been, well, we'll take one last one. Yeah. <laughs> I just had one okay. quick question for Mr. Ellis. Uh, did you have any role in saving the Bracken Bat Cave? land and what, so, and you might describe that for us sure so so the the city of San Antonio um, a few years back um, became involved in the protection of 1200 acres that was very close to the Bracken Bat Cave the Bracken Bat Cave is owned by uh, Bat Conservation International and the land around that that cave it's if you're not familiar with the Bracken Bat Cave um, it, it's, a, it's a really neat place but it is home to the largest paternal bat colony in, in North America and in the world and, that, in, in the world excuse me <laughs> um, and and it's a, a, a really amazing phenomenon to see the bats emerge from the cave but um, there was 1,200 acres of land that was under the threat of development um, uh, uh, several years back. The city of San Antonio got involved, um, partnered with the Army, the Nature Conservancy, Bat Conservation International, the Edwards Aquifer Authority, and a few other agencies, um, as well as, the, as Bear County, um, to identify some funding um, for uh, the, the purchase of that property. Uh, that, that property is now owned in tandem by Bat Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy and is monitored by the City of San Antonio's Aquifer Protection Program. Um, and so it was, a, it was a very unique partnership um, spearheaded by now uh, Mayor Ron Nuremberg from the City of San Antonio who took a keen interest in this particular property when he was City Councilman um, for District 8. But, uh, became a very, um, uh, you know, uh, it became a, 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 a poster child uh, project for collaborative uh, partnerships uh, between multiple agencies to protect to protect land, and, and and there was a valid interest for the city of San Antonio because it was also located over the recharge zone. Great. Well, thank you guys for your time and your passion and for all the great questions. <laughs>